Okay, welcome to the cohort three, tier one ATSI identified schools and FY23-24 technical um, assistance webinar. My name is Monique Sullivan and I am the continuous school improvement coordinator for the department. And although I am listed under ESCA, I work with the assessment team under Maine's model of school support which falls under several sections of the ESSA statute, but specifically Title I, Sections 1111 and Section 1003. Section 1111 is actually where it's written in statute what all the school improvement plans have to include uh, for those schools that have been identified for different statuses or different tiers. And then Sections 1003, is actually where the funding is attached. And in Maine's model school supports, the only funding, the only schools that receive section 1003 funding are schools that are um, have the status of tier three. So um, we have the mission and the vision and the strategic priorities for the Maine Department of Education. Um, I'm not going to read all of them, but just wanted to let you know that this is the driving force behind all the work that we do at the department. And then today's objectives are to learn about a main DOE sponsored professional development opportunity, um, the Transformational Leaders, Leaders Network, TLN. Um, understand tier one identification criteria. I know there's been lots of questions about that, so we are going to spend a little bit of time on that. The different identification statuses, so you have an understanding of all the different variations that um, a school could be identified for, or different statuses. Understand the requirements for Tier 1 ATSI school improvement plans. Understand how to read or look at the school profiles, and then hopefully plenty of time for you to ask any questions um, uh, that you have. Okay, I think it slowed down a little bit. I've been letting a lot of people in. Um, and I am going to, I didn't know if Fran, if you had, if you did have a slide to share, if you did, I can give you permissions. Um, if not, I'm going to turn it over to Fran Farr. And bef um, while she's getting set up, I just wanted to let you know that this, uh, what Fran is going to talk about is the Transformational Leaders Network. It's the TLN. And um, when you got your letters uh, notifying you that your school was um, a tier one school, you were notified that you would be, have access to any main um, sponsor or sponsored professional development, professional development sponsored by the main department of education, and it would be at no cost. So this is a program that if you want to participate in, your school principals want to, uh, to participate in, because I know there's some principals here and there's other people here, but if a school, if a tier one school principal wants to participate in the transformational leaders network, it will not cost the school or district any funds. That is part of the support um, when you are a tier one school. So you can you can take it away, Fran. Oh, great, thanks Monique. And I just, I can't see many faces, but I see one former TLN right on my screen and that's Sarah DeRust, hello. Hi Fran, <laughs> um, good to see you. I'm excited to be joining you this morning. Let me just tell you, I'm Fran Farr, I'm the lead facilitator for the Transformational Leaders Network. Uh, let me, um, talk about what the mission is, is to create an ongoing community of principals engaged in learning about themselves and their leadership. And I'm going to use a lot of quotes. So rather than sound like a um, car salesman, my hope is that um, I will uh, be able to share their, their thoughts rather than mine. So here's a quote to start, which is the essence of our work. The TLN served as a reminder to be intentional in all ways, but especially with the focus of my energy and attention. I want to aim for the areas of high impact. Yes, addressing the negativity is important, but building relationships and focusing on the people who are moving forward is in a constructive and cohesive direction is critical. As staff, we are charged with carrying the banner for our school, Poor relationships, mistrust, and a lack of clarity can silently kill a school culture. The TLN welcomes all principals across the state of Maine. Each year, we have principals at varying levels of their career. For example, this year, we had a first-year principal, 
We had a 19 year veteran. We had one who serves both as a principal and a superintendent of a tiny district. We had other principals that principaled two schools. We had many who are mid-career, some who are considered already engaged in uh, post-grad and grad work, all hardworking, dedicated administrators committed to leading for the betterment of education and the success of their students. So whether a principal of a tiny rural school with limited staff where leadership team is the entire staff, or the larger schools where principals have a separate leadership team all strive to build and distribute leadership. And here's another quote, improving my leadership skills directly enhances our school climate. Learning to communicate clearly with both employees and parents has had a significantly positive impact on our school environment. We have re reoccurring themes that run through the year depending on the needs of the group and they include goal setting and communication and feedback and values and distributive leadership, conflict management, we talk a lot about difficult conversations, school climate and culture, self-care, that's, that's really risen bubble to the top in the last couple of years and sustainability, and a celebration of self and staff and students and community. Note to self, principals don't take time. They're busy celebrating everyone else. They do not take time to stop and reflect on their own wins and accomplishments, and it's imperative that we recognize our efforts. This will be our 13th year in operation. We first served just the identified schools, um, tier schools, and then in 2019, at the urging of Commissioner Macon, the TLN expanded to welcome all school principals in Maine. We'd love to have you sign up and register for the 24-25 school year. It's a crazy time of year. And frankly, asking you to put the TLN registration at the top of your list is a big ask. So this is simply me saying that you'll have access to the information on the DOE website in the next couple of weeks. And you'll scroll down the drop down menu under educators to, edu or to professional leadership, click on the TLN page. And then there, I think there'll be a QR code where you can simply register. Additionally, you're gonna receive a blast through the DOE media, going to all superintendents and principals before the end of the month, providing specific information. And then in August, the Educational Summit on August 6th, 7th, and 8th, there are plans in the works to share videos and testimonials from former TLM members, sharing their highlights of the program. And there will also be an opportunity to sign up on site. We pride ourselves in being open and flexible. As facilitators, we are all current or former school administrators and recognize the monumental work that you do each and every day. The work is never done. We are committed to learning together, searching for answers and networking and building a community. These conversations are held confidential. It's a big state, but it's small. This is between and among school leaders. Who better to walk through issues than others experiencing similar circumstances and situations. To quote a principal, becoming, become a school leader and fully embrace the transition for the beautiful mess that it can be. The network will hold six in-person meetings in September, October, December, March, May, and June. And we have four remote sessions and or regional sessions in November, January, February, and April. So there's something every month, and I'm gonna put the dates in the chat for you. The remote or regionals are Zoom, and if you're in close enough proximity, what we started doing this past year is meeting in, in, informally at a restaurant, a group of four or five of you together to talk about educational evenings in an informal setting. And those will be posted on the website and advertised. So consider the dates and hopefully you'll be able to squeeze them into your busy schedule. We ex ex uh, accept registrations on a rolling basis. Last year, one of our members didn't join until December. She was pregnant and then she had a baby and she was on maternity leave. And once that was all um, squared away, then she joined us in December. Uh, our sessions are based on your needs. And this is not a course. We do not require homework. 
We often take the essence of an article or a book that we're reading, we synthesize the information and we discuss key points together using protocols and consultancy models. We gather the input at the close of every meeting to determine what's working, what needs work, and what next. And we use the results to inform our session, pulling together the most current research and articles here. After reading and listening to the group's response this year, we could not ignore the fact that we're still in turbulent times filled with continued chaos and difficult situations. Consequently, we're gonna focus on a theme of exploring and expanding the emotional intelligence of school leaders in our work. We found a couple of great resources, books that will be distributed to all members to guide us in yet another productive and meaningful year of principal leadership growth. For me personally, this, ne this network represents what I wished I'd had as a principal. The principalship is often a lonely, solitary job. You believe in education and developing positive success for those you lead, but often it feels like you're always wrong in someone's eyes. You're a middle manager pressed on the one side by staff and the other by central office and parents and community. And you must strive to maintain your balance and integrity and choose where you're going to stand to uphold the tenets of education because you pledged yourself to focus always on what's best for kids, not what's easiest for adults. At our first session last August, we asked, what do you hope for? And one principal responded, the challenges of leadership hit a climax last year. I'm hoping that participating in the TLN will help me see the joy again in serving my school commitments. I'm excited to collaborate with other leaders to learn from them and support each other. And then what better way to close than with a message from another principal who says, we dream together about what education can be and walk out the door refreshed and ready to take on another day. So thank you for your time and listening to me. I'm happy to answer questions or you can write them in the chat and I'll respond. Thanks, Monique. Thank you, Fran. Um, like I said, um, this professional development is sponsored by the main DOE. So um, as tier one schools, you um, will get that at no cost. So if your school decide, uh, principal does decide to participate in this, or if you're a school principal and you'd like to participate in this, go ahead and you, it won't be any cost to you. And I think as we start going through this presentation, which I'm gonna start uh, sharing again, I took that off because I wanted people to um, focus on Fran and not on the slide deck. So, okay. So like I said, um, there's a lot to tier one. It's not as much as tier three, but I think after hearing some of the requirements and expectations that you know, participating in TLN might be a really good option for um, you as a principal or for you to recommend um, if, you're not the, if you're not attending as a principal um, for the school principal. And I did put the link to the TLN website for the Maine Department of Education. I did put that on in Great. the chat. And I think Fran said she's gonna add some dates to the chat. So hopefully you'll have a better idea about that. So to keep moving along, I just wanted to give a basic understanding of the identification model. Uh, Maine did have some um, revisions to the model. We had some amendments, we had some adjustments. Um, all that has been approved and it was approved in like early April. And that's why we're kind of um, behind in our identifications. So Maine's model school support is run every year, but identifications are made every three years for tier two TSI and tier three CSI, and every six years for tier one ATSI. The next identification cycle will be the fall of 2027, um, but eligibility to exit tier one status or convert to another status um, will also be in the fall of 2027. So you could convert to tier two or you might convert to tier three, um, or you might actually exit. So before I talk about that, all those different variations, I wanted to give people an idea of how many identification statuses there are right now. Um, uh, with an FY23, 24, we have 12 identifications that went, are going out or have been or already gone out. I've got about half of the notifications that have sent out to schools. Um, there, I think I have four left that I have to do. Um, they're not new identifications. I just have a reminder of their identification status, but. We have tier three that 
We had 13 schools that were able to exit with no support. We had 23 schools that were tier three that were able to exit, but they had to convert to tier one because they still had at least one student population that was struggling um, across all the indicators. Uh, we had tier three, uh, we had uh, 13 that were unable to exit. They were not meeting the exit criteria for tier three. Um, and then we have tier three not eligible to exit because um, they are in their third three-year cycle. So last this year was their first year. They have to stay in for three years. So they still have another two years. And then we had 27 that, although they were identified for, um, for tier three support, they were outside of the, um, the tier that actually receives uh, financial support. Um, and then we have tier three identified the supports this year in FY23, 24, and there were 18 of those, 16 were identified and then according to our model, if we have any identified school that has a feeder school that is not a part of the main models of school support, that means that they don't, they don't have any assessed grades or they're not included in the main three-year assessment because maybe they're a pre-K three school um, or pre-K two school, then they're considered to be a feeder. Um, and then tier three, we did have uh, some schools that met the criteria to be tier three but they're not getting support because they're outside of our 5% and there were 29 of them. Um, all of those schools have been notified of their status. Um, and then tier two, um, we, we did not make identifications for tier two because of the way the model works. Um, but we have, so we have 86 that were schools that were identified for tier two uh, last year and they're finishing up their first year in that status and they still have two more years. And then we had tier one, these were schools that were identified in FY18-19, uh, but for a variety of reasons with COVID, uh, we amended our plan. Um, and so there was a, that three-year cycle was a little delayed, but when we ran the model this year for FY23-24, uh, there were 35 schools that were not able to exit tier one status because they have at least one student population that's still experiencing challenges. Um, I'm sorry, we had 35, sorry, just the opposite of what I said. We had 35 schools that were actually able to exit tier one status because they didn't have any schools that was experiencing um, in challenges. I apologize. I've been doing this kind of identifications for the last like three, four weeks. So it's all just starting to, so I apologize for that. And then um, we had, did have, like I said, we had 69 schools that were not able to exit tier one status because they did not meet the exit criteria. And then we had tier one that are 55 that are not able to exit because they're just finishing, they're just finishing up their first year in tier one. And then fast forward to where you guys are, you are the tier ones that were identified in FY23, 24. There are 36 schools that were identified for the status. Um, and you will be starting your first year um, um, next school year. So as you can say, um, there's a lot of different, there's able to exit, not eligible to exit, unable to exit. So able to exit means you've done your three years and you've met all the exit criteria. Unable to exit, you've done three years, but you don't meet the exit criteria. And not eligible to exit means that you haven't done the three years, so therefore you, you're not eligible to exit because all of our tiers have at least three years to be in that, um, in that status. And again, this was just to give you some clarity why it's taking us so long and why your superintendent might be getting multiple notifications because you might have schools in your district that are in different tiers and um, different in different um, time frames or cycles in those tiers. So specifically to this group, um, cohort three, we're calling in cohort three because this will be the third time we've run the model. I'm sorry, the third time we've um, made identifications. Um, I can tell you that identifications uh, got kind of the cycles kind of got thrown off again with we had COVID for two years, then we amended our plan and we couldn't, um, we could, we were required to, to identify schools last year, but we couldn't exit schools last year. So that's why we wouldn't normally have back to back identifications. We did identifications in 22, 23, and we're doing them again in 23, 24. That was because uh, some of the requirements of the of, of the U.S. Department of Education. Hopefully this year and moving forward, getting get get back on that three year cycle. Uh, but there might be some weirdness in between because we have some schools that are kind of on off cycle. So there might be some schools that are converting or exiting a status based on that. Um, but the tier one status is for three years. Um, you have to have at least one student population 
is experiencing challenges um, across all indicators. And I say at least one because you could have four, but if you have five student populations, you're not going to be um, tier three because it's not all of them. It's it's all, all, more than one, but not all of them. You'll be eligible to exit for in the fall of 2027 because it'll be three school years. And then when you get to that point, you'll have several options. Um, the school could exit with no support. That means that no student populations are experiencing challenges emerging, emerging across all indicators. You could remain tier one if it's a different student population or it's a different, maybe it was your um, economically disadvantaged in 23, 24, and then in 27, it might be your um, a students with um, uh, disabilities. That might be, so that's a different group uh, or different uh, student population. And then you can convert to tier two. So if after three years, it is the same student populations that are experiencing challenges, then you will convert to a tier two. And then you could potentially convert to a tier three, and that is if all your student populations are experiencing challenges across all indicators. So as you can tell, this is you can, as you can see, this is a very nuanced um, identification system, and um, it's not just a simple um, SAT status. So in regards to the ATSI or tier one um, uh, school improvement plan requirement, and I did. I did allude to this in the letter notification that I sent to schools that there are requirements when you are a tier one. There are uh, is no there's no additional funds. There's no section one zero zero three funds that are um, that are uh, allocated to tier one identified schools, uh, but there is the requirement to do um, a school improvement plan. Um, and the plan requires a plan described in subparagraph B, which is in the, I'll talk about in the next slide. You have to identify resource inequities, um, and then you also have to address through your school improvement plan. You have to address um, um, you have to address those resource inequities. So once you address, so once you identify them, then you need to address them in your plan. And this is in section one 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 little d two big C. Um, and then specifically when it referenced paragraph B, um, this is what this is. So they want you to do these pieces, but they also want you to do some of the work that if you are a, a TSI or a tier two school, they want you to have specific stakeholders. They list them, the principal, other school leaders, teachers, and parents that are a part of the development of this plan. And it is school level targeted. And I'll talk about on the next slide, some options you have for that. Um, and you want to talk, you want to have a plan that's going to improve student outcomes based on the indicators that that render the identification status. So if it looks like math as an area and it's um, maybe your students, um, your student population, your white student population, then your plan needs to address that. Um, and you need to have evidence-based interventions, which isn't anything new that's been around since 2015. Um, you want to get the plan needs to approve by your SAU. Um, needs to be monitored by your SAU. And if after, um, you know, it does after a number of years, it doesn't seem to be working or it's not, it's not having the impact, then the SAU needs to, to um, do something different. So in summary, I try to put it all on one page here. So the school improvement, uh, the school must develop a plan that is reviewed and approved by the school and, and the SAU. It must be developed in partnership with stakeholders, principals, other leaders, um, other school leaders, teachers, and parents, is informed by all the indicators in the main state's accountability system, and includes one or more evidence-based interventions. Now, I put the asterisk there because I know that um, most schools, well, most school um, or SAUs have a CNA, and some of you who are in this meet in this meeting also um, have schools that operate Title I school-wide pro uh, programs. So if you're a school and you operate a Title I school-wide program, then you have a school-wide plan or you have a CNA slash school-wide plan. That's what the CNA is, school Comprehensive Needs Assessment, and the SWP is school-wide plan. So if your school is already operating a Title I school-wide program, you already have a school-wide plan. So you can use that as your school improvement plan for tier one, for ATSI, the ATSI tier one plan. It just has to include all of the tier one plan requirements 
that I talked about on the previous slides. Um, so that's the thing. So you don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to start from, from something new. You don't have to go grab something and create something new. You can take what you already have and you can just make sure it includes those sections. Now, some of you may not be operating a Title I school-wide program because I apologize, I've neglected to say that. Tier one and tier two, you do not need to be a Title I school. The way Maine's model school support is, um, is uh, written, a every school in the state of Maine, it can be, um, goes through the Maine's model school support for identifications when the models run. Any school in the state of Maine can be a tier one. Any school in the state of Maine can be a tier two, uh, public school. Um, and then tier three designation or identification status is for schools that are operating a Title I program. So um, if you're not Title I, then you wouldn't be ever, you would never be identified as a tier three, but um, but all schools are, are can be a tier one or a tier two. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. So if you're um, a school, but you don't operate, you don't have Title I, um, but your school does receive ESCA funds, then they're going to have to have a comprehensive needs assessment for the school, for the school district. So you can also use your SAU CNAs, CNA, um, um, but it also has to include the tier one identified schools. So those, those tier one schools have to be identified in your SAU CNA and all the tier one plan requirements need to be in that, um, that SAU CNA. So typically CNAs uh, for an SAU may be more broad, but if you're going to use it as the school improvement plan, uh, the tier one ATSS, ATSI plan, then you have to spell out those tier one schools um, and you have to create, you have to make sure that what's um, what's identified in the CNA is targeted to those uh, tier one um, schools and includes the tier one plan requirements. Now, if you are don't meet one or two and your school um, is in an SAU that does not uh, receive ESCA funds and you're not operating a Title I school uh, program, then you will have to create a school improvement plan. I don't have the link in here, but I can add it um, into the chat. But we do have a template that we have at the Maine Department of Education. We call it our CNA um, school-wide plan or CNA uh, SWAP template. And you could use that as a starting point. Or if your school already has a plan, maybe you have already have a strategic plan, you can use that as well. Again, you just want to make sure that you are incorporating all the pieces that are required for a tier one ATSI plan. Now the note here is here, all, all documentation needs to be kept at the school site. Um, we're not gonna ask for anything at this point for the main, from the main department of education. We're not gonna ask you to submit your tier one ATSI plan. We're not gonna ask you to submit any of that in regards to tier, um, tier one identification stats. However, school improvement is going to be included in the FY24-25 ESCA monitoring. So if your SAU is selected for FY24-25 ESCA monitoring, you will you will have to sim you will have to show your ATSI plan. You'll have to submit that as documentation as part of the evidence when your when your um, SAU is monitored. So I stress keep the documentation um, I know if you're if you're Title I school wide, you already have to do that as part of the ESCA application. If you're a school, if your district receives ESCA funds, you already have to do the CNA. So again, if you uh, can incorporate it into what you're already doing, just make sure you have those ATSI or Tier One um, components. Then, um, then you're not really starting from scratch. It's gonna take a second. Yeah, so I, Julie, I think I just saw your, your um, there, yep, I answered your question before I could answer it in the chat. And I will try to remember to put that in the chat. Um, okay. So one of the things we are asking, especially if your SAU has an ESA consolidated app, right now, they're really, it's not a really easy way for us to, um, to send you information, but in the um, ESA application, so in grants for me, if you are have an e, you do have ESCA funds, then you have to complete um, an ESCA consolidated application in grants for me. That's the federal program or federal um, the software management program we use for federal programs. 
Um, if you can go into or whoever your user administrator is, sometimes it's a superintendent, sometimes it's um, the curriculum coordinator, sometimes it's a different person. If it's a small district, sometimes it's the principal wears 10 different hats. If you can have your user administrator go in and actually um, assign the title, the tier one um, principals, uh, assign them a role. And the role is the LEA tier one principal. It's already in there. All you have to do is select it and put that in the address book in the ESA consolidate application. That way we can send you information like if there's a professional development opportunity or um, when this recording gets um, uploaded to YouTube and it's ready for viewing along with the slides, I'm gonna send the notification through grants for me and I'm going to click LEA tier one principal as, a as someone to receive the um, email notification. If um, the tier one, if the principal is not selected and doesn't have that role, the principal won't get that email. So that's why it's really important if you can have your user um, administrator go in and set that role for your tier one principal. And I know there's a lot of movement over the summer and people change positions. So whoever your user um, administrator is, the one who signs the roles in, e in the ESA Consolidated app, um, um, just keep track of that because we don't we're we don't know if things change. So if the emails changed or you had movement in your district and now you know, the elementary principal is now the middle school principal and you have a new principal, just you know want to keep that up to date. And if you are a school that doesn't have an ESA consolidated app, just send me a separate email um, and we'll try to have a separate list for those schools that are not in the ESA um, consolidated. The majority of our schools all receive or their, their SAUs, I think like 99% of the schools are already in the ESA consolidated application. So we're just trying to use um, uh, what we already have for our resources. Okay, I have said quite a bit and I'm trying to go quickly because I want to leave time at the end for questions. But I think this is the last piece and that is the school profiles. So in the letter that you received um, from me, I think it was a couple weeks last week or I've sent so many I can't remember exactly but um, you received a, a web page which has a, um, a password protected to go to see the school profiles. Um, uh, that is not public facing. This is public facing. The dashboard is um, the, on the website on the main DOE website. It's the main model school support. If you go to that you'll see how the schools are um, what their ratings is. But it doesn't give the level of detail that's on the school profile. This just does the main indicators and says how you're doing across, but it doesn't do that, doesn't break it down by student groups or student populations. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the features that we've added to the school profiles this year to provide a little bit more data. I just want to also stress, I don't have it highlighted here, but the state assessment data and the chronic absentee data, all these are separate, but they're all added in. That's all you use to calculate the means model school support identifications. So the main small school support is not gonna have data in there. Um, you'd have to go to the state assessments or the different tabs, or even go back to your Acacia or your main through year assessment and go in there and dig down and see some of that data. This is just more of a compilation of that data. So the de this website that I'm kind of circling here, that is the public facing one. The one that you received in the notification, that is one that's just for identified schools. Um, and that information um, is for, it's for schools. Um, so the tab, it's called Tableau site. And uh, if you click on that, you'll see a school profile, you'll see the end count, you'll see the graphs, you'll see achievement goals. We added, um, this year we added graphs, achievement goals, identification over time and map. These last two, we just added like a couple of weeks ago. So just go through these real quickly. So the school profiles, and I this looks really messy, but I tried to annotate it for you guys so you can see why this school was identified for tier one supports. So um, it's kind of the backwards, only one student population in this school profile was not struggling. Um, so that's why this school is a tier one and not a tier three. Um, and if you go down, you read the, prof the, um, the formula down here, I know a lot of schools were like, it's our chronic absenteeism that got us. It's more than chronic absenteeism. Now I know there's a direct link between being absent and, and, and achievement, but it's not the sole factor which will um, render a tier one or tier two or tier three identification status. It's and. So 
if you look across, it has a um, chronic absenteeism rate of 10% or higher. And um, you look at the, uh, the, the ELA, academic progress and academic achievement, those are ands or um, academic progress in math or academic achievement in math. Um, and I know I've been getting some questions about how are those calculated? Um, I, I don't have, I didn't have a lot of time to go through that, but um, there, and I can put it, I'll try to put it in the chat too, but the plan, the amended plan, the, the approved amended plan is actually on our website um, and you can read through that. It's 194 pages. So I recommend doing a search and find uh, to find what you're specifically looking for, but it outlines how the calculations are made for growth, how the calculations are made for achievement, if you want to get down into that um, level of the data. But as you can see, if you go across here, economically disadvantaged was not a group that was um, identified. I was actually, they were a group that was identified for it. Um, actually, no, they weren't, sorry. I'm looking at the wrong. So if you go across the economically disadvantaged, um, they had um, a red in the academic progress, but they had a triangle in achievement. So they did not meet both ands. And then if you go across to the uh, math, um, they had a red for the uh, progress, but a triangle for the achievement. So that means they were excelling um, or accelerating. And so they, this student group or student population did not get, um, there was not experiencing str or struggling um, across the indicators because they, you have to have that and, uh, but the other ones were. And so that's why the school was identified for tier one. And this is an elementary school. And as you can see, um, and they don't have an English language population or multilingual population. So that's not considered um, a student population. To be a student population, you have to have at least 10 um, to be included in the Maine's model of school support. Um, another thing that we added here was end count. So you can see like how many students um, participated across the um, indicators and across the different student populations. Uh, we have graphs, so if you just want to look and see across um, how your different uh, student groups or populations are doing across indicators. Uh, and then we added um, achievement goals. And this is, oh, did I do that wrong? Nope, I think, I apologize. I, I skipped that slide, so I will make sure I add that. I don't know where, I must have skipped it or deleted it, but there's also achievement goals which actually goes across and it tells you where you need to be each year. And so if like you're trying to think, okay, where do I need to be by 2027 to exit tier one status? We have that mapped out for each school. Um, and just want to uh, preface that. And I will add it to the slide deck before I send it to you guys. Um, it won't be in this recording, but we'll, it will be added to the, to the slide deck. Um, so the FY23 is actually a state average because we had to start from somewhere. But starting in FY24, it will be based on your school. So the growth rate and achievement rate or the achievement rate is based on your on your particular school. So it will be different for each school. But we had to have a baseline in FY23 because we had um, last year's uh, F, um, May 3 assessment was um, norm reference and the Fed said it has to be criterion. So it's um, that's why we had to have a, a baseline for this year. Um, and I, like I said, I will add that to the slide. This is a brand new slide that we just added like in the last week or two. And that is, if you want to know your status across the years, you want to know your school status across the years, um, you can be in one status one year and then the next you could be in a different status. And it is um, just to let you know that everyone who's tier three or every school that's tier three is automatically tier one but our model defaults to the highest level of support. So um, that way you could, if you go on, you could see, well, I'm a tier one and a tier two, but we only post the what's the highest level. Um, and then we added this too, and because we had, we, a lot of schools wanna know if there's other schools near them that are in that same status. Um, and so you can go in and you can uh, sort by tier, you can sort by, by, um, by SAU name. And you can find out the SAUs and the school names. I didn't include that in this, but on um, the screenshots, but you can find out if there's any schools that are near you that are a tier ones or um, other levels. And that is it. We have our resources, um, available resources for you. We have professional development calendar. 
Um, again, if it's a DOE sponsored professional development, that is at will be no cost for our tier one schools, identified schools. And then this is our contact information. Um, Tyra, she's our business analyst, so you probably won't have much interaction with her, but um, you definitely can reach out to any one of us if you have questions. And then this is how you can stay connected to the main department of education. And now I'm just gonna leave it open for any questions that you have. I am gonna stop the recording um, and feel free to unmute yourself or um, ask your question in the chat.